Well, good, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the warm welcome to be with you. The, uh, the message today is going to be in two halves, and there'll be a, another reading in the middle, like a sandwich. So um, we'll have part one, then I'll read from a little bit further on in 1 Samuel, and then we'll have the second half. Let's just pray before we come to God's word. God our Father, we have sung saying that the earth is filled with your glory. But we also want to pray that here in our church today, this place would be filled with your glory. That there may be a sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit with us, and that we would hear your voice speaking to us, each one. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the first bit of a sermon is a little bit of license. We're going to listen in on an imaginary conversation. The scene is a village in ancient Israel near the borders of the Philistine territory and the name of the village is Ebenezer. And I want you to imagine it's evening, the sun is setting on two women. We'll call them Mrs. A and Mrs. B. They're standing at the village well, drawing their water. And we're going to listen to their conversation. Mrs. A. If you ask me for my opinion, Mrs. B, it's nothing short of scandalous. I mean, what sort of name is that for a boy? Ichabod. What's he going to think of that when he grows up? He'll be teased something rotten. Why couldn't he be given a nice ordinary name like Joshua or Daniel? Mrs. B. Quite right, Mrs. A. I can't imagine what got into the head of his poor mother in her final moments, for Lord rest her soul. I suppose it was the shock. It's quite bad enough for that poor Ben that on the day of his birth he lost his mum, his dad and his granddad but to saddle an orphan with a name like that you'll get a complex about it. Just imagine, Ichabod, eat up your greens. Ichabod, why have you left those figs on the side of your plate? Anyway, what's it mean, Ichabod? It must mean something. Else, why would she have dreamt up such a ridiculous name for a lad? Mrs. A. Exactly what I asked my Micah as soon as he got back from the battle and had finished his tea. And he mumbled it was something to do with glory. But that's a girl's name, I said. You can't call a boy glory. No, woman, he said. He's not called glory. In fact, quite the opposite. The name means the glory is gone. Mrs. B, you can say that again. The glory is gone, all right. Those Philistines made mincemeat of us this time. And what's more, they've pinched the Ark of the Covenant, the cheek of it. That's where the Lord's glory is supposed to dwell. After all, though it's many a long year, now since anyone I know has seen it. But now the ark's gone, the glory is gone from Israel. Mrs. A, mind you, it's been going for quite a while, if you want my opinion. I blame his granddad, Eli, though I know I shouldn't speak ill of the dead. He was a dear old soul, 98 and blind as a bat, he really should have taken those two sons of his in hand long ago. It was daylight robbery, what Hophni and Phinehas got away with at the sanctuary up in Shiloh. Last time my Micah went up to offer a sacrifice, they roughed him up and took all the best meat for themselves, leaving only gristle and bone for the Lord. And they call themselves priests, Rogues would be a better title in my book. Mrs. B. Tut, tut. 
There's even worse than that, I can tell you. Now, you know I'm not one to gossip, but what the two of them got up to with the servant girls at the entrance to the tent of the meeting just doesn't bear repeating. And what did Eli do about it? He didn't lift a finger. No wonder the Philistines wiped the slate slate clean with our lads. We got no more than we deserved. I think the Lord's given up on us. He's had enough of Israel this time. The Lord has left us. The ark's gone, after all. Perhaps the Lord has gone with it. Mrs. A, you're right there. The glory of the Lord has departed. Mm. Maybe Ichabod's not such a stupid name after all. Anyway, we've all got to rally round and look after the wee lad. He's got nobody else left. And off they went muttering Ichabod under their breaths. Now, as I've already said, you won't find that conversation in your Bible. You won't mention, find any mention of Mrs. A or her husband, whom I called Micah, or Mrs. B. But actually, all the other characters in the conversation you will find in the first four chapters of the first book of Samuel. Described much as I've described them. There's Eli, the aged priest of the Lord at Shiloh. A good and godly man who had gone a bit soft in his old age. His two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, priests after him, but two of the most greedy and immoral figures ever to carry the title of priests. There was Phinehas' wife, giving birth prematurely to a son following the shock of the news of the loss of the ark and the deaths on the same day of her husband and her father-in-law. Then there's the orphaned baby boy named Ichabod by his mum as she died in childhood. It was a low point in the history of God's chosen people, Israel. It was a time when the sins of the past had caught up with her and the outlook for the future seemed as bleak as bleak can be. You know, there are times in the experience of the people of God, in our experience as Christians, when the consequences of the past seem to leap up and grab us round the throat. In one way or another, we know we've messed up our lives. But what's done can't be undone, we may say. All our yesterdays cast a long, dark shadow over today and tomorrow. However much we twist and turn, we can't seem to escape the shadow. Yeah, we can deeply regret mistakes that we have made. We still have to live with the consequences of those mistakes. And one of the worst things is, But God, who was once so real and so close, can sometimes seem very far away. Just as the moral and religious corruption of Israel had led to defeat in the battle against the Philistines of the capture of the ark, well, so in our own lives we can experience defeat. And if we allow what we know to be wrong to continue unchallenged in our lives, it begins to fester like a sore and gradually infects our whole relationship with God and the joy can begin to fade. The victories become more rare, the defeats become more common. Before long we might be at the point reached by Mrs. Finneyhas when in her despair and dying agony she named her infant son Ichabod. The glory of God's presence can sometimes seem a fading memory. Oh, that's a pretty depressing message, you may be thinking. I didn't come to church this morning to be depressed to hear bad news. Well, neither did I, actually. Take heart, we haven't reached for good news yet. Even in Israel's darkest hour, routed in battle, with the Ark of the Covenant in enemy hands, there was a ray of hope. Because there's another character in 1 Samuel chapters 1 to 4 whom we have not mentioned so far 
And it is, of course, Samuel himself. Samuel, you'll remember, was a child who was the miraculous gift of God's grace to the childless and desperate Hannah, whom Hannah had freely given back to God in grateful dedication. We're told in chapter 2, verse 26 of 1 Samuel, that this young lad continued to grow in stature and in favour with the Lord and with men. He continued to grow in stature and in favour with the Lord and with men. I wonder whether that rings a bell in your mind. Because it's exactly what Luke tells us about the young Jesus in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. I'm just reading it to you. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. So, the story of Samuel is actually one of the inspirations in the mind of Luke as he talks about the miraculous birth, not of Samuel, but of Jesus. And Mary welcomes the news of God's amazing grace to her in a great song of praise which the church calls the Magnificat in Luke chapter 1. When you get home, have a look at that. Look at Hannah's song in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and then look at Luke chapter 1, at Mary's song. And the one mirrors the other. Mary was very much uh, thinking about the story of Samuel as she uttered that great song of praise. So Samuel is a figure who foreshadows, points towards Jesus. He is somebody who is close to the centre of God's plan of salvation and once he comes into the picture there's hope. So although the first half of the sermon sounds a bit gloomy, the second half of the sermon contains a message of hope. I'm going to read from 1 Samuel, chapter 7, beginning at verse 2, <coughs> as far as verse 13. It was a long time, 20 years in all, that the ark remained at Kiriath-Jerim. And all the people of Israel mourned and sought after the Lord, and Samuel said to the whole house of Israel, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtorefs and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and Ashtorefs and served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah and I will intercede with the Lord for you. And when they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel was leader of Israel at Mizpah. And when the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. And when the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it up as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage in Israel in battle. But that day, the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, 
slaughtering them along the way to a point below Beth Khan. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far has the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not invade Israelite territory again. Now there's a few things I just want to draw out uh, from that second passage and then to link it together with the first one. The first thing to notice is that it took quite a long time for matters to be put right. The art remained in Philistine hands for 20 years, we're told, in verse 2. And sometimes we have to wait for God really to put things right in our lives. Being Christian doesn't mean that we believe God will always wave some sort of magic wand and at a stroke all our problems are gone. We still have to live with the consequences of our past mistakes. It may take God time to heal all our yesterdays. That's the first thing to notice. 20 years it took in their case. The second thing is that at the end of that 20 year period, the people of Israel at last begun to do what they needed to do at the beginning. They began to search their hearts to try to find their way back to God. This is two to four. And Samuel says to them, if you were returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then do something. Rid yourselves of your foreign gods. So that the first thing we need to do when we're struggling with our past sins, our past mistakes, is to acknowledge our need, to be honest with ourselves, to be honest with God, and maybe admit, well, the glory is gone a bit from my Christian experience. And God's power doesn't seem as real as it used to. But once we've taken that first step, of searching our hearts and beginning to search for God, God's grace takes over and the next steps begin to open up before us. Third thing to notice is that Samuel, who's now a grown-up man, exercised some decisive spiritual leadership. He stuck his neck out. He said what needed to be said to the people. If you really mean business with God, if you're serious about trying to find your way back to him, well then there has to be some action. You have to make some hard choices. Put away those foreign gods and idols in which you've trusted. Be prepared to take the radical step of depending on God alone. And that's what they did. They're told in verse 4, the Israelites put away their Baals and the Ashtaroths, these foreign uh, idols and serve the Lord only. See, repentance is not just a matter of words. Repentance is about translating words into action before God. Mm -hmm. That may mean getting rid of whatever we know is coming between us and God's desire to bless us. That's what idolatry is. It's when we put something else in place of God's rightful place in our lives. So getting rid of our idols, whatever they may be. The fourth point to notice is that once they'd done that, once they'd begun to put away these false gods from their lives, Samuel led them in prayer, in very serious and earnest prayer. Samuel, got the whole people together, assemble yourselves at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. Join me in prayer, he said. And they all joined in. You see, God's forgiveness, God's mercy, are not something we can obtain just on a coin in the slot basis. It's not a case of just, all right, I'm sorry, in goes the coin of repentance and pop 
outcomes, God's blessing. It's deeper than that. The rivers of God's mercy only really begin to flow freely when we've come to the end of our resources with nothing left but to throw ourselves on God's grace. That's what the Bible means by prayers of repentance, prayers that really cost us. But that's the sort of prayer which God honours. And that's exactly what happened. Now the Philistines had noticed all Israel had got together in a prayer meeting. They down their swords, their heads down, they were praying. All right, now's our opportunity. We'll go out and massacre them. And once the Israelites saw what was happening, they were scared out of their wits. They said to Samuel, please don't stop praying. Please don't stop. We've got to go out to battle. Keep crying out to the Lord for us while we go off to fight. So Samuel continued with his offering to the Lord while the men ran off to fight. And as he prayed, God answered. Before anyone struck a blow, God intervened with a tremendous thunderstorm that threw the Philistines into panic. Deliverance came at the very moment, the very moment when the people of God seemed most vulnerable, most frightened. God intervened. So Samuel's prayer of urgent intercession turned into a prayer of thanksgiving. And he was so full of thanksgiving, he said, we've got to mark this occasion. And he got a large stone. And he gave it a name, Ebenezer, which means stone of help. Here's a sign, a permanent marker, Samuel was saying. Something that whenever you pass it in future, you and your children after you will remember that God helped us. God has helped us thus far. Now he may have meant this primarily in a geographical sense. The stone marked the spot where God's saving help had been demonstrated in an amazing way. Now do you remember the name of the village where Mrs. A and Mrs. B lived? The village where the Philistines won the battle and captured the ark? Yes. Ebenezer. Ebenezer has already appeared in 1 Samuel. And now Samuel calls this stone Ebenezer. The Lord has helped us. So Ebenezer, the place where originally there had been disaster, now becomes a reminder of God's grace and faithfulness. People wouldn't forget that other Ebenezer, a place of defeat and shame. But they would also remember whenever they passed that stone that God had intervened in grace and mercy and victory. The same name carried with it two opposing memories. A reminder of defeat and a reminder of victory. You know, in our experience, the name Calvary has something of the same double meaning to us. Calvary is simply the Latin for Golgotha, the place of the skull outside Jerusalem. An ugly and fearsome place of execution, but we also believe it was the Jerusalem landfill site, a rubbish dump, the place where everybody left their rubbish. And when we think of Calvary, we are reminded of the rubbish, the garbage, the trash of our own lives, our own sin and rebellion against God, everything dirty in our lives and the lives of the world that drove Jesus to the cross. So when we turn our eyes to Calvary, yeah, we're reminded of the rubbish that God has had to deal with. But we're also reminded of the amazing grace of God in Christ. 
something that transformed the garbage into something beautiful, a place of hope and salvation. And I think Samuel also intended when he called the stone Ebenezer to remind the people that God had been faithful down the years in helping his covenant people for all of their weakness, for all of their sin. So maybe he meant the stone to say not simply thus far in terms of geography, but also until now the Lord has helped us. Whenever we have really needed him, he has never let us down. And certainly that's how many Christians down the years have interpreted this verse. Thus far has the Lord helped us. If you go into the Welsh valleys, you will find quite a lot of little stone chapels called Ebenezer. Because their founders wanted to proclaim through a visible construction of stone, their faith in the covenant faithfulness of God that endures from generation to generation. Ebenezer. Now, we don't generally erect stone pillars these days when we want to say something clearly to the world. We're more likely to have a big flashing neon sign. If we were to erect a big garish neon sign outside the church, it wouldn't mean a lot to people going up and down Queensferry Road if we were to stick the word Ebenezer on it. What's that about, all about, they would say. But what if it were to say 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, God will never let you down. God will never let you down. Perhaps the message would begin to sink in and people passing might say, oh, all right, I wonder what that is all about. Just a thought. From Ichabod, the glorious departed to Ebenezer. These two passages are a story of how God can turn even the blackest of yesterdays into a bright tomorrow. We have to be willing to let him. The first step is actually to acknowledge that maybe the glory has faded a bit. And God can then begin to work. He can move us back to the point where we can say with conviction and confidence, Ebenezer, yes, until now God has helped us and he will help us again, and again, and again. Thanks be to God. Amen.